All right. Well, welcome to this uh, seminar on About Founders Stock. Uh, we have um, a few people here uh, at OTBC as well as uh, a lot more watching online. So welcome, uh, everyone, and thanks for joining us. We'll get uh, into the program in just a minute. First, wanted to do the just a quick introduction as to who we are here at OTBC. Um, for those of you who are new, which we have actually a number of new people uh, online, uh, OTBC is the Oregon Technology Business Center. We're a, a nonprofit incubator for startup companies in Beaverton, and what that means basically is that we do programs like this. Uh, plus, we have office space and we do a lot of mentoring uh, for uh, startups. Uh, and in fact, we're the highest uh, highest rated mentoring program for startups in the state. So uh, we, we did just move to a new space. We have room now and we're definitely recruiting companies. So if you're a startup and uh, looking for some office space, we'd love to chat. You can just use our, our contact form uh, at otbc.org to, uh, to get in touch with us. And um, let's see, so today I'll be doing the presentation. We have uh, Jim McCright with uh, OTBC. Uh, here also today, he's going to be uh, watching for uh, any comments on the uh, YouTube channel. He should be able to ask questions, and uh, and we'll try to keep track of that and uh, make sure that we answer those also. And this is, by the way, the first time we've tried a Google Hangout streaming to YouTube. So uh, knock on wood, with a little luck, this technology will work out. And uh, But if you have any comments uh, just on the process, that would be I'm sure interesting for us to hear too. With that, let's see. Anything else? I forgot, John. I think that's it. Maybe the material. All right, let's uh, get going. We're going to share the screen here to let you look at the set of slides we have today, and one of which you've already seen for about 20 minutes. All right, so about. Again, this uh, the whole focus here is about uh, founder shares and uh, and stock in general. Have to do the uh, the usual disclaimer first, of course, that this is educational material. I'm nowhere close to being a lawyer, so this is not legal advice. Uh, but we do know a lot of good attorneys. If you'd like to talk to uh, to somebody uh, in more detail about uh, about these topics, and here's what we'll run through in this uh, this seminar. Uh, and again, certainly encourage people both here in the room and, and online to uh, ask questions as those come up. But we'll talk about what is founder stock, uh, a couple things you should do to protect it, um, a little bit about stock options and stock option compensation as opposed to uh, founder stock, and then talk about the uh, a cap table or capitalization table uh, and a little bit about dilution and, uh, of course, that, uh, that control issue, which is always an interesting topic and uh, go into uh, into valuation and how that works. All right, um, so what is stock? Um, this this uh, came from no less an authoritative source than uh, um, Wikipedia. So uh, here you go. It's you know, really basically just, uh, it represents pieces of a company and, and ownership and the capital paid into uh, to own uh, those pieces of the company. And so, really, it's uh, it's a pretty arbitrary thing. You can mimic. You know, we're we're focused on stock for this presentation. You can mimic all of this stuff with an LLC structure. Um, with an LLC, you can do just about anything. What is a founder? It's not um, not really a, a legally defined term at all. But typically, um, you know, when people talk about founders, they talk about people who are probably working for stock for ownership in the company. Uh, as early on as opposed to for money until you get to the point where you get some investment or some revenue. Um, investors like it if founders put off taking uh, salary for as long as they can because it stretches their investment. Uh, but investors do expect you to be able to, to start taking a salary once, the, once they invest. We'll I touch on that a little more. Um, the, um, and, and very frequently what happens is a founder in return for their stock basically uh, they're assigning the IP that they've developed with respect to the company to the company, what, what they're bringing in with them and what they develop in the future that's relevant to the company. So that's usually the deal. You get stock in, uh, in return for that, although you also pay for it, but we'll get, uh, we'll get to that. So 
Um, again, founder stock, there, there really, uh, there, there isn't actually any official stock called founder stock. It's just common stock typically, but it's generally uh, means the, uh, the stock that a founder would purchase when they, when they join the company. Um, so it usually is common stock, although there are weird cases where sometimes it's some sort of preferred shares, but usually common shares. And, and yeah, it usually is bought. Um, founders generally buy their stock, which you want to do um, at, typically at a very low price because the idea is you divvy up stock to the founders pretty early on where you can justify that the value of the company is pretty low. And uh, once you, you write a check for it, it establishes your basis in the stock from a, a stock investment point of view so that, of course, the goal is to, to have a long-term gain uh, whenever you turn around and, and sell the stock once it's worth something. So you want to establish that, uh, that basis as early as you can so that all that gain is long term. And it is important in a lot of cases to do this 83B form, a federal form, that you want to do actually within 30 days of writing your check for uh, the stock if there's any possibility that you could forfeit the stock. If there's no possibility of forfeiting the stock, you don't have to worry about this. Um, but there should be, as we'll get into, and um, so more often than not, that's an important thing to do is to submit your 83B within 30 days uh, of, of actually writing your check and buying the stock. So, um, and again, we'll talk about protecting shares and why, why there should be the possibility of, uh, of a forfeit. Um, now, compared, I wanted to just touch on options. Options is a huge topic all by itself. We don't want to get into that, certainly. When you get into an option plan, you'll spend a lot of time with your attorney figuring out how this works. But just to compare and contrast with, uh, with founder shares, you know, an option is, is literally nothing more than, than the right to purchase shares at some point in the future at some given price. Um, if done right, there's usually no tax imp uh, impact when you are granted uh, an option. And options come in two flavors, qualified and non-qualified. The, uh, the qualified um, is, uh, is for employees and the non-qualified is, is what you can use for vendors. So it is a different kind of, of option you would use for a vendor. It, you know, typically the qualified would be a, uh, for of an ISO, an incentive stock option for employees. Uh, and again, uh, you, can, you can use them with vendors. And you might want to use them for vendors, basically trying to twist arms and say, hey, we'd like to get a price break. Um, and you know, here's some options. Uh, in, uh, in exchange for that. Um, so back back to the founders' shares then, which again are, are what you're going to use earlier on. Later on, you'll transition to using options as your stock compensation. One question that um, often comes up early on is how many shares uh, does each founder get? And you know, the bottom line there is it's a negotiation. Um, what, what I like to remind founders of is it's just mainly important that uh, uh, that people walk away from the table thinking, okay, that was fair. Because uh, if you start out in a company with founders thinking they've been screwed over, uh, it's not a good sign. Uh, and it's not a good way to start. So, so it's important to keep talking about it until uh, everybody decides it's fair. And, and, and it's important to talk about it up front because a lot of people come uh, to the table with different expectations. You have a lot of people that, that assume, hey, we're three of us, so it's going to be a even three-way split, and that's absolutely not always the case. Um, you know, my last startup, certainly, it was uh, kind of my, uh, my concept, my vision. I pushed a lot to make it happen. Yeah, I got, it wasn't a one-third, one-third, one-third split. We had three founders. Um, so, uh, again, it, it's an important thing to, uh, to talk about, agree upon, and write down and, uh, and sign uh, so, that you, uh, so that you don't run into misunderstandings. Uh, and, and this is a biggie because I, I, I have seen this kill companies um, when later on you, this, you finally get to the point where you're about to close uh, or talk to somebody about an investment. You have to get this nailed down uh, before you do that. And that forces the issue of who gets how much. And then it's late in the game and there's money on the table. And, and it's just not the time to, to do that. Um, and typically, if you haven't done this, it means you also haven't done your intellectual property assignment agreements where the founders assign their IP to the company. And that means everybody owns their own IP and it means everything is totally up in the air. Bad time, bad time to be negotiating. Uh, you want to do it early and, and have that all in place. So 
really important thing to uh, uh, to take care of early on. And here's you know really simple example. I, again, if I go with a uh, a typical kind of uh, startup with maybe three founders. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming not uh, a three-way split. So here's 60-20-20. Um, so you've split up the whole company betwixt the founders. And, and then just for example, let's say you decide to add a fourth founder. Somebody, um, somebody else can certainly show up later. They bring a lot to the party. They, they're willing to work without salary for a while. You know, it makes sense to make them a founder, even though they came in a little bit later. Well, then what do you do? Well, it's an interesting challenge because uh, somehow uh, you need to uh, to come up with uh, the shares for that person, and and you know there are only a couple of options. I mean, one is uh, you simply issue more shares for them, in which case everybody gets diluted evenly, and you could argue that's probably the fair thing to do. Um, it, it maintains the kind of uh, uh, distribution that uh, you originally started with. Or, you know, founders two and three might twist the arm of founder one and say, hey, you, uh, <clears throat> you have a lot more shares. Why don't you give a little more? Uh, and again, it's just all a negotiation. But um, there, there, are no, there are no fixed and fast rules there. Um, you know, the, another question that comes up a lot is, well, how many shares should you issue when you first incorporate? And that's a really good question for your attorney. There is no right answer. Um, and different attorneys set things up different ways. Um, one interesting thing to think about that's more psychological is think forward in time to your first funding round. You know, if you have a zillion shares of stock out there, you'll, you'll do a funding round that, at maybe two or three cents a share. Well, psychologically, that's a little funny. Um, you know, if you issued fewer shares, um, you know, having a stock at 25 cents or 50 cents or a buck or whatever um, can feel better. But that's purely psychological, right? There's absolutely no, um, there's, it's totally arbitrary. Uh, it, it really doesn't matter that much. So again, it's a good good idea to talk to your attorney. Perhaps you're going to talk about it, but uh, the difference between authorized shares versus issued shares. Um, yeah, yeah. That this, you know, it's one question as to what you actually uh, issue, and another is that you can authorize a lot more that that don't get issued you'll always end up issuing ultimately more shares. And if, and if you didn't authorize more at the beginning, you will, <laughs> you will eventually. But there's, as you add people or you take investment dollars, you always need more stock. So, so yeah, whatever, uh, I guess that, that is the other thing to keep in mind is however many shares you issue, don't worry, you'll issue more. Um, especially if things go well, you'll, uh, you will issue more. All right, so that's that's kind of the the brief overview. A little bit about uh, you know protecting your um, your stock, um, you know, and that basically the question is there: what happens if a founder leaves uh, because they got a better offer that they couldn't refuse, or because they were asked to leave because it wasn't working out? Um, this is absolutely something that a, a venture uh, will want to see uh, written into your stock agreements before they'll invest. And then increasingly, you know, a lot of angels are smart enough uh, and experienced enough that they'll want to see that too. Um, because, you know, the, the situation here is, let, let's say you have the 60-20-20 split, one of the 20% or even worse, the 60% the leaves the company um, after just a few weeks or a few months. You absolutely do, don't, it's not fair, it's not reasonable, and it doesn't make sense for them to walk away with all that stock. Um, so, so somehow, somebody left after just a few weeks, you know, they probably ought to give pretty much all the stock back, maybe all the stock or at least most of it, uh, because they just haven't had enough time to, to make much of a contribution. And that's where, that's where you get into the declining buyback is, is a really common solution. There are, you know, probably others too, which you can certainly discuss with, uh, with your attorney. But this is a really common approach is that you buy the stock, you buy it all at, at a low price, uh, and and that's great. You establish your basis. You own the shares. You can vote the shares. But the company has the right to buy it back um, if you leave early. And um, again, very very common. Then over time, that right de declines. If you you stay a year, you know they can buy back some of it, but not all of it. Two years, three years, etc. So again, very very common thing. It has the advantage though that again your your capital gain clock starts as soon as you write your check because you just bought. Um, all of the stock. 
And back to the 83B, that's what I meant in referring to a, there's a risk of forfeiture. You have this kind of agreement in place, that's where there's a risk in forfeiture, that's where you need the, uh, uh, the 83B. So it's um, really a bit of maybe like investing, right? So it's it's words, kind of like, invest over time, you're mimicking over time. a vesting process, yeah. So, so if I stay for a year and a day and then I leave, maybe the company has the right to buy back 75% of my stock. Um, and they probably buy it at the same low, low, low price that I paid for it, not some arbitrary, gee, what's our value now kind of price. Um, and, and then my payoff is for that one year of work, I take 25% of, of what was agreed upon. Um, but if I leave after two weeks, wow, maybe, maybe I have to sell it all back, or virtually all. I mean, if I, if I can, donated some, some valuable IP, maybe there's a rationale that I should be able to keep a little bit more of it. But, uh, but yeah, it's very much like a stock vesting. Um, Could this also be in parallel with a cliff? There's a six month or one year. Oh, absolutely. Like, like if I, if it, you can, again, it's, it's just a contract, right? It's, it's, it's written into your shareholder, your stock purchase agreement, right? depending on how the attorney structures it. But yeah, it could say if you leave before six months, we get the right to buy it all back. And, and that would be a six month cliff. Um, or we get the, the right to buy it all back except 1% or, or whatever. Um, so yeah. Yeah, so it, since it's, it's a declining buyback right, so you can put in the contract exactly um, when that right starts to decline. And it doesn't have to start to decline right away. It could decline after six months or a year or, or whatever. And, and, you know, in the startup world, it's, it's not that unusual to see, like for options, to see them go for six months or a year uh, before anything vests. So that, uh, that can happen with founders' uh, shares too. Uh, but again, the advantage of the buyback approach is that you, you own all of it and can vote all of it up front. And as long as you stay, you, uh, you get to keep all of it. All right, so um, now a little, a little about option compensation on the, one, on the other hand. So um, the founder shares, again, it's a negotiation. It it's really, really comes down to a question of what are you bringing to the table in terms of IP that you're turning over because you already developed it and what are you expected to contribute in the future based on your skills, abilities, dot, dot, dot. Um, and of course, all that's a little fuzzy and it's, it's all open to negotiation. Um, and you divvy up the company. But then looking forward, eventually after you, you know, maybe typically get your first investment round, somewhere in there you're going to make a, a shift to where it's, uh, the company's further along, uh, founder shares aren't appropriate anymore, you'll start issuing some uh, shares that are allocated for an option pool. And then the question is, okay, as you bring in people, how many options do they get? Well, that's, that gets into a, um, some interesting questions too. Um, but again, so typically these are for employees, not founders. It's a little bit later. Um, and, and also, again, for, for vendors and partners. What's typical, it depends a lot on what stage you're at and other things. If you're pretty early stage, you know, these are just some examples of numbers that are really typical that I've seen. But again, you know, you, you go read these to somebody and they'll probably come up with a recent example that's different. Um, and one of the best things to do to get a feel for what's reasonable is talk to your attorney because they see a lot of deals including stock options and they get a good feel for what's, what's market. Um, and number two, your investors. Your investors are perhaps the most important because the a, they see a lot of other deals, and B, they have to think that your stock option plan makes sense or you'll have other issues, right? So, um, but, uh, but it's quite a range. You know, to, if, you, if you, uh, you bring in a CEO, they're not one of the founders. Um, if, 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 if the CEO is the founder, no, they don't, they don't get more options, right? That's what the founder shares are for. But, um, but you bring in a CEO that wasn't a founder, yeah, it, it's not unusual to see 5 to 10%. Uh, 10% would be like a superstar, um, and it could be maybe a little under 5% if, if, uh, if they weren't such a superstar. This but, is 5 or 10% of what? Is it oh, of, 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 of shares, the company. Of the allocated shares? Or the, oh, yeah, of the allocated, yeah, of the shares that are actually issued. Um, yeah, and, and again, you know, these are always rough, and, and they're always approximate. And the further, the, the more headway you make, the lower these percentages should be, because the further you are, the lower the risk is. So my, my assumption here is this is pretty early, defined pretty early. I don't know, it's, it's fairly early, you know, 
certainly maybe after just uh, or coming up to a first investment round, you know, kind of stage. Um, but again, the, the good thing to do is to talk to your uh, um, talk to your investors uh, to see uh, to get the latest snapshot of what's reasonable. Um, one, when, you know, one tax pointer: don't uh, when you're negotiating. Um, God, this actually goes for either with an employee or or a vendor. What you don't want to do is say, "Here's my rationale that says these options are worth ten thousand dollars right now, and I want a ten thousand dollar discount, you know, in return for these," because you just priced your options when you do that, and um, and that means uh, they instantly do become a taxable event. So that's great. The vendor gets these this piece of paper um, that isn't actually worth anything today, and and suddenly has a three or four thousand dollar tax bill. Um, if if that got written down somewhere, right? So, so that is one thing you want to be careful about. Like you don't write that into contracts, um, and uh, it, it's always better to to just to pitch the future. And and this goes for employees too. It's like it's uh, it's 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 not a percent of the company. It's ten thousand options. And if we do what our plan says we'll do and exit in four to five years these options then will be worth $100,000, right? And yeah, there's risk, but this could be really valuable. And that's why it's a good deal for you employee or it's a good deal for you vendor, you know, whichever. Um, and yeah, you, you're, you're essentially selling future value. Um, this, is, this is all the, the thing that you always see the disclaimer for, right, on selling stock, right? This is not a, a promise of future. Blah, blah. Well, that's absolutely what you're doing with options, right? You're, you're pitching that, yeah, hey, if we're on plan, and sure, life has risk, but if we're on plan, these are worth a lot in the future, not today. So by um, you having saying it's 10% of the company, if you use that term, does that put you at risk then as you allocate more shares? They say, well, you told me I have 10%, so they get more shares legally because they've said 10% versus you know, I, as as far as I'm aware, I don't think there's I don't think there's too much legal liability there. But that it gets to be more of an issue when you get down to you know you're just a little further along, and your next software engineer is going to get one tenth of a percent of the company, um, and it's a little more motivating to say you're going to get ten thousand shares, and if we're on plan in four years, that's going to be worth this much money. You know, so it, it's in this perception. It's you know the percents if you doing, no, even if you aren't doing well, the percents don't go anywhere but down, yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, whereas the whole idea is hopefully the value is increasing and it, it's, it, I know, it tends to be more motivational to talk about, you know, it's 10, 20, 30, 50, 100,000 shares. And if we're on plan, you know, this is what we think it'll be worth. It's just more positive, but especially as you, as the percentages get smaller. Um, okay, a little, little about then the the cap or capitalization table and and dilution and uh, and control. Um, the um, so a, a cap table is, is in its simple simplest form just a table that shows who owns what, uh, and but it tends to go into more detail about exactly what did each investor pay at what stage and what percent did they own at that stage and so forth. Um, and so what that shows you then as you go through multiple investment rounds is not only who owns what, but, but really what the dilution is and what the net value is. Because hopefully what happens is everybody's getting diluted, but the stock is, is worth more and more. So hopefully you'll see, you, yeah, your percent gets diluted, but your value, you hope, of course, goes up. And I will show you a home run example. Um, so again, you know, an example here we have... Uh, you know, it's a really simple cap table. Um, the 60-20-20 example, and we'll assume that uh, they issued a million shares. Usually, you would issue more than that, but I'm using really easy round numbers here. So you've got um, a total of a million shares, which means, okay, founder one has 600,000 versus founders two and three. And then they close a $300,000 investment. So their pre-money valuation is a million bucks, um, which means they have a million shares, pre-money is a million dollars, and, and the pre-money just means that's what the investors decided they're worth, or that's what they could justify that they were worth. Well, and again, I'll talk a little bit more about, well, where did that come from? But um, so they got a pre-money valuation of a million dollars, they'd issue a million shares, so it's a buck a share. Amazing, simple math. Um, and uh, an investment of $300,000, 
So the post money is easy enough to calculate. It's 1.3, a million pre plus the 300K. Um, and the investor, it's a simple matter of doing the math, you know, 300K divided by 1.3 million, investor now owns 23% of the company. Um, and, however, investors being clever, they know that you're going to have to issue more shares um, to cover all those future employees you're going to hire with the money that they're investing in you. Um, and so it's not unusual for them to require that you allocate some number, 15, 20, even 25 percent isn't unusual, um, to the stock options. And they want you to do that um, uh, after taking their investment into account. So they still end up owning 23 percent, which is another way of saying it's the founders that take all the dilution of the, uh, the option pool, usually. Um, so it ends up looking like this. You know that the investor owns 23%, and by fiat, the option pool is 20%. So the investors in the option pool total 43%. Simple math, just by definition. Uh, that leaves 57% for the founders. So the founders who, who did own 100% now own 57%. Um, and again, just, just following through on the math, 34% to the one founder and, and 11.4 to the other two. So again, as, as happens, you, you get diluted. And to, to make all the math work, you can then calculate, um, you know, given the valuation, how many shares had to be issued to do that 23% to do the, uh, how many have to be allocated to do the 20% of the option pool. And then you've got the original million, add that all up. Now you have, you know, 1.754. Uh, million shares. So again, it all it all gets just uh, generated from your pre-money valuation, uh, kind of determines how all these stock numbers are going to net out. And that's a very simple version of a cap table for just one, one equity round. Um, one question, uh, does that mean that the, uh, the founders are still in control? Uh, they, between all of them, uh, still own more than half the company. And uh, so technically they have a lot of stock uh, voting that they control. But, um, but my argument is, well, no, they're really not very much in control anymore. I, I would argue that anytime you take investor money, you're, a lot of control goes away. Um, usually, increasingly, even angels, almost always VCs, uh, will get preferred shares. And the preferred shares, um, always have special rights. That's what makes them preferred. Uh, and the most common uh, right would be a veto on big decisions like somebody wants to buy you. And, and that's, that is a huge amount of control. Somebody could offer to buy you for a price that would make you very happy, but to the investors isn't good enough because they're looking for a home run. And, and they say no, and, and you're unhappy because you would have really liked that deal. Um, they may have a board seat, and the board uh, hires and fires the CEO, so that's a lot of control. Uh, and um, But to me, the biggest control is the last one. Very few companies get to cash flow positive on one round of investment. Um, and, that, and to make that next round happen before you run out of money, you really do need your first round investors on board. That gives them huge leverage uh, to negotiate, because as you get down to three months of cash, two months of cash, one month of cash, your negotiating leverage is not strong. Um, so, um, <clears throat> yeah, it's, you know, when you take money, it's like being addicted. You have to have more. And, and it's, it's just about to run out. You know, you don't have a lot of negotiating leverage. So, uh, now, the better you do in terms of hitting your milestones, the, the less likely it is that you'll get that low because so many other investors are going to be ready to uh, to invest. And that actually reduces the the, uh, the leverage that your current investors have. So, you know, Steve, I think we've talked to a lot of entrepreneurs who say, I don't want to give up control. And in their minds, it's 51% or more right. the stock they control. And I, as, as you say, it's not necessarily having control of your company and <clears throat> looking down the line and being very optimistic if you think you may go public someday. Um, most uh, studies of companies, venture funded companies that have gone public show that the CEO founders uh, on average when they go public own about 6% of the stock. So, And they still come out very well if they have the opportunity to go public and 
and their stock, as you say, is worth a lot more at that point than it was yep. when they founded the company. So the percentage of stock you might own as a founder is really not as critical as just performing well with the company and rising stock value. That's really the issue. And, and controlling 51% of the company, absolutely, of the, of the, um, of the stock, the right. common stock, absolutely, yeah, yeah, does not mean you're, you're in control. So, yeah, control is kind of a fallacy once you set, accept money. Okay, this, uh, this is impossible to see, but the, the goal wasn't to see it, just to give you sort of an overview example of the, this example uh, cap table uh, that we have um, that you can download from the, uh, uh, our tool page on the website. What I, I did this overall view just to show that what you've got here is, uh, and I'll zoom in a little on this, but you've got kind of what the founders started with and a seed round and a series A and a series B and a series C, and that each round, again, it shows what happened, who bought what, what was the dilution, what was the increase uh, in, in value. Um, so here's a little bit of a zoom in to the first couple of columns. You, you start with you know, the, the founders, uh, in this, this particular case, looks like they should four million shares uh, of stock, and then came a seed investment. So they started uh, with four million, added a million for the option pool, that gave them five million. Um, they, uh, they got a pre-money valuation of, uh, of uh, a million. Well, they had five million shares, so in this example, they're 20 cents a share now, and uh, they wanted to raise $350,000. Well, if you know it's 20 cents a share, you know how many shares of stock you have to issue uh, to get uh, 350K, uh, and then you know what their post money is, and uh, again, calculate the number of shares and so forth. So then at the end, you have the founders all having the same number of shares, um, but now here's the new percentages compared to what they were before. We got just a one-one comparison here. So they went from you know 50, 25, 25 to what 30, 15, 15 in this case. The investor now owns 26%, and I cut it off in the zoom in here, but the option pool is gonna own something a little bit less than that. So again, that's kind of the idea. Then starting with the next round, if you do good, hopefully your pre-money value goes up. And it's higher than, than your post money value from the previous one, and um, and you go on and on. And again, I'll I'll get into a, a real world uh, example. Um, what about uh, valuation? Uh, that's another question that uh, uh, I, I I stayed away from earlier. But you know, how do you how how does the investor figure out what you're worth? And it is you know, frankly, I always find it to be a frustratingly arbitrary process for uh, for entrepreneurs because it's partly based on market pricing. Um, you are pitching investors, they're getting pitched by lots of other companies, you're being compared to companies that are totally different from you, uh, unless your investor happens to always invest just in your kind of company, um, which can happen. You get investors that will only do clean tech or only do software as a service, which case at least it's a little more apples and apples. But they're probably companies that you absolutely don't compete with and that you're in a different market they're, they're a different business model, and yet financially, that's who you're competing with. So how far along are they? How far along are you? How completes their team? How completes your team? Um, what are you asking uh, for in terms of evaluation? What are they asking for? Um, you know, you end up getting compared. And so it is kind of a market uh, phenomenon. And um, one of the things, uh, one of the sources of information that can help on this is your attorney. Uh, because again, they, they tend to see a lot of deals and they tend to be a little less biased than your prospective investors. Um, although once you get through a, a first round, then your first round investors can be a really good source of information because they're kind of on your side then um, and they can give you some uh, some guidelines. But um, but it, it, is, it is sort of frustratingly uh, arbitrary. There's no business school analytics that you can do uh, based on projected revenues or discounted uh, 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 profit, et cetera, et cetera. It just, you're too early, you're too risky. So it really is more of a, a market phenomenon. And, uh, and again, you're, you're, uh, either your attorney or investors who are not biased because they're not going to invest in your company. Those are good sources of information uh, about what's realistic for your stage. But when, when you look at a, an early stage company that doesn't have any revenue yet, um, it's at least in the Portland market, 
you can get differences in feeding frenzies in the Bay Area, different from up here. But in the Portland market, boy, for software companies, it's really unusual to see a, a first seed investment pre-money that's more than like a million or a million and a half. Um, and um, for any company that, that builds stuff, well, then you, you, you tend, it tends to get into a unique situation. So it's kind of hard to, um, to draw any kind of uh, generalizations. But, uh, but again, your, your, your attorney and, uh, and independent, uh, uh, uninvolved investors can be a good source of data. How does the number of patents play into valuation? If you have one company that has two patents and the same the company down the street, somewhat in the same discipline field, holds 30 patents, are we still comparing apples to apples or apples to oranges? Uh, do the, does the number of patents affect the valuation? It, you know, it, it depends. Um, th this is it, this is frustratingly like the question of well, what do angel investors look for? Well, angel investors are all different, and they all look for different things, right? So, uh, this is the same sort of thing. You can absolutely have thirty patents that are completely and totally worthless, <laughs> right? <laughs> and you can have one or two patents that are golden uh, because they actually really do what most patents don't do, which is keep other guys out. Um, and so it's it's hard to say. You know, patents, you know, having patented technology, which is to say having something that at least the Patent and Trademark Office agreed was non-obvious and novel, um, is, you know, tends to be a positive thing. Uh, so, some investors actually give you more credit for a patent than they should, because more often than not, a patent really doesn't provide you that much protection. Sometimes it does. In, in life sciences, like pharmaceuticals, it's critical, because uh, those really do keep competition out and, and that's very important other other areas that may or may not uh, help uh, so so again it's it's really hard to say I would say in general patents the fact that you have one or more patents does tend to be positive it, it tends it, it's another indication that you have your act together um, but I, but I think it's pretty fair to say that there aren't many investors who would say they have 30 you only have two they're better and unless they bring in an expert to look at them and decide that, wow, those those are 30 like awesome patents. And then, sure. VCs are more likely to do that kind of sophisticated due diligence though, more, more than more than angels. I don't know, another thing that might be worth mentioning. So I often hear people say that founders focus too much in the valuation, like they really want a really high valuation, but the danger of getting really high valuation is if your next valuation needs to be equally higher, like the investors want to see progression in the value of the company. And if you put a high early value, I think it'd be hard to deliver that, hard to deliver that. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's absolutely uh, true. You can work too hard to get a, a high valuation. And um, um, like sometimes you'll, you know, people will twist arms with really unsophisticated angels, get some ridiculously high valuations. And then when you get ready for a VC uh, round and they come in and do evaluation and, and you end up with a cram down, which is to say they give you a lower evaluation than the original round, which means the ownership gets percentage gets reduced a lot and people are very unhappy. So yeah, yeah, that's a good point. They uh, uh, getting evaluation too high can, can be a problem. Um, same thing can happen if you just don't hit your milestones, you can, end up with a post money that's actually lower than, than your last, or pre-money lower than your last post money. And it's just not a happy place to be. It does not make your investors feel good. You know, it is a matter of negotiation and one way to uh, avoid spending a lot of time on negotiating an arbitrary value is we're seeing more and more angel investors come in with some type of convertible debt where they really don't place a value on the stock. They're waiting for the VC round or institutional round to come in and then it converts at that value. So they don't spend, have to spend a lot of time arguing about what the, what's the value at this very early mm -hmm. stage when you're free revenue. Yep, and, and that, that tends to be cheaper uh, to do like a convertible note for that reason, you're putting off the, the valuation um, and because that, that takes less, less lawyer time. And that tends to be a good thing for the entrepreneur because it lets you make more headway before you get a valuation and then that note converts, you know, with some kind of kickers because the because it was earlier money. Um, now, 
and and that gets into the whole other topic. We'll, we'll have to do a we'll have to do another convertible note program one of these days because then uh, what you're seeing now that you didn't see so much two or three years ago is caps put on the notes, um, and that effectively is putting a limit on on the valuation they're willing to do, and and so you got to look at those. Um, but uh, but yeah yeah convertible notes are, are cool that way because you you get to make more headway um, before you get valued. So you should be worth more. Let's see. Okay, a home run. Let's wrap up here with a, a home run uh, example. Um, this this actually is a real life example from uh, just before the bubble uh, back in the uh, the nineties. Um, a company called Gadzooks Network. It's a little bit unusual to find somebody who will actually publish this kind of data. But when I think of it was a, a guy with the uh, Alliance of Angels down in California that uh, that published this, um, so it was a nice uh, bit of data from the real world. So this company did um, right at the beginning of '96. They did a Series A. They had a pre-money valuation of four point six million. Now I, I don't know the history before that, but I'm I'm guessing they probably had like a seed angel round before this. Um, it probably wasn't their first round. Uh, although again, this kind of stuff happened more during the bubble, right? But uh, but they probably made some headway. Um, got a 4.6 million pre money. Um, their a, uh, Series A investors invested two million dollars, and uh, and so the post money was it was 6.6, and the Series A owned about 30 percent of the company. Now, just as a side note, back to uh, to Jim's earlier comment, uh, given that they probably allocated some money to um, some money to uh, an option pool uh, plus uh, the Series A now own thirty percent. Founders probably own something less than fifty percent. Yeah, good good chance good chance that the CEO visionary that kicked it all off probably ended up a good chance they owned roughly maybe the same amount the Series A. Again, I haven't seen that data, but that wouldn't be surprising uh, after after one round if it was roughly the same as the Series A. So keep that in mind. Um, all right, so we they finished their Series A, and then in September, just nine months later, they did a Series B. Their pre-money was $17 million, so they went from a previous post-money of 6.6 uh, to $17 million. They clearly hit some milestones. Uh, either that or they just got a real feeding frenzy going on. Um, they raised another $8 million, so their post was 25 Now, again, just doing the math, uh, the Series A went uh, down to 19%. And um, and by the way, I think I'm I'm kind of ignoring here because we didn't really have the data uh, taking into account what happened to the option pool. But I think somehow he baked that into this because uh, again, it came from an, uh, the angel who had the inside picture. Um, so okay, so the Series A are down to 19%. Um, May of '97. So again, just a few months later, let way us under a year, they did a Series C with a 69 pre. Wow, so they went from a 25 post in the previous to a 69 pre, so they clearly made a lot of good headway. They raised another 10 million, so they went up to 79, and then they did a Series D um, a little over a year later. They were slow on that one, uh, but 135 million pre money, so they more than doubled, um, not more, but they almost doubled from their previous, and it raised another 21 million, so their post money was 156 million. Um, and now the Series A are down to owning 13% of the company. Uh, after that, they went public, and and the rough valuation was a billion dollars. So, at the end of all of this, the Series A that started out at thirty percent, and I'm guessing again, CEO maybe same ballpark, uh, very probably less if there were multiple founders. You know, could have could have easily been half that. Um, and at the end, the Series A owns thirteen percent. So again, as a guess, maybe the CEO owns own somewhere between six and ten percent. And they get bought for a billion dollars. So the Series A investment of $2 million turned into 13% of a billion dollars, or $130 million. Now, anybody would call that a home run. That is, what, a 60x return? Uh, that's pretty good. Uh, that probably is better than pretty good. And uh, But but again, um, I'll bet you, I'll bet you in this case, the CEO, it could have he could have had like a measly 5% of the company. 
which would have only been worth like 50 or 60 million. Um, so even though it was a small number, um, it, uh, I'm sure it worked out very well for the founding team. Now, I'm aware of another company during this crazy bubble time here in Portland that, that the founders, three founders each put in $3,500 to start the company. And uh, two years later went public and their $3,500 worth of stock was worth $17 million on the offering day. So they did pretty well. Maybe even better than pretty well, yep. All right, uh, so just to mention, uh, at the uh, you can download uh, the OTBC uh, cap table to play with, uh, put in the, your, your own numbers and project your own uh, cap table, predict your own cap table uh, on, on our tool page here. On that page also, you see a link to the blog archive, has lots of interesting uh, curated blog posts basically on uh, things like founders team, compensation stock, lots of interesting stuff there. Uh, the cap table itself. And Startup SOS is another one of my side projects. There's a, a lot of how-to stuff there, um, including a write-up about stock under uh, the build a team category. And so uh, some more resources to check out. And that's it. We can, um, and we got plenty of time to talk about more questions if you got any. Another question I have is, so as far as buying the founder stock, you say you put in a certain dollar amount or two cents or something per share, right? so you have to then put the money in. Is there ever a time where you actually don't write a check to it? You actually, because maybe other investments you've done to get the company up and going that's applied toward your founder stock, or is it actually coming in and literally writing a, a brand new check regardless of what you put in? That, oh, it, that does happen. Um, I've, seen, um, I've seen cases where it, it, it's, it's not uncommon for you not to write the full check. I, I think an attorney will usually tell you to write some of a check, um, but uh, in return for the goodwill, the IP that you're putting in, if you're putting in specific stuff, and I, IP is specific stuff, then yeah, you can you can justify, like maybe normally you'd put a $2,000 check in and uh, you put in a $500 check instead because you've assigned all the stuff that you've worked on for the last year yeah. into the company. So you, you definitely see that uh, going. But by the way, for, for people online, I think, our, our belief is that you can use the, uh, the comment um, field there if, if you have uh, questions to ask. Although, again, this is a learning experience, so we, we think that works. Um, and we'll keep an eye out for, uh, for any comments slash questions you have. Any other questions here locally? We're slowing down. We might have to, we might have to look into this uh, how, how well the commenting works. I, I should have I should have had a, a somebody out there specifically to make a comment just so we could make sure they come through because uh, we haven't seen one yet. Yeah, Lou. The cap table. Uh, do common stockholders have rights to look at that as the company grows? So if it, in a first, let's say a first round, mm -hmm. people are buying common stock in that first round. If they're not buying preferred stock, do they have what rights do they have to get that kind of information? Now, you're saying if, if they're investors or we're talking founders? No, investors. Investors. If, if to that first round of stock, let's say they put uh -huh. out for a dollar a share, uh, but they're buying common stock, what rights do they have to information like the cap table as the company grows? Well, so they, they might, they may or may not be buying common stock, uh, even as early angel investors. They might be getting preferred with some kinds of rights. But, um, you know, it, it all comes down to what the, the share purchase agreement says. Um, the, um, it typically will say something about information rights. Um, and and you usually do want to put some kind of a lid on those. I mean, it's usually, usually when you have investors, they're, they're going to have some rights to see some kind of updates on the company. But what, what you don't want is, especially if you have a lot of angel investors, you don't want to have people um, constantly at your doorstep asking you for more data on financials and stock breakdowns and this and that and the other thing. So it is really common to see written into the, the purchase agreement uh, some constraints on, on the information and like how, how often uh, they can get it. Um, but you know, it's, it's a negotiation, right? Because I, I, if I'm sitting here with my checkbook saying, so you want my money, Lou, or not? <laughs> <laughs> right. 
um, and and you negotiate what what sort of access they'll have. Uh, but yeah, it, it's to the startups. Um, best interest to not, you know, to, to keep it, to keep it reasonable. Um, and, and of course you can put non-disclosure um, kind of words in there too, right? So that, and in fact, you, you probably do, um, so that they can't go, you know, because this is all confidential information for sure. But I think as much transparency as possible is really a good thing with the investors, particularly the early stage, because uh, they will not only very probably, if things are going well, participate in the next round of investment, uh, but also have their own contacts of other investors they might lead you to. So I think when founders keep things too close to the vest, they, there's this natural feeling of what are you hiding? Or what are you not telling me? <laughs> and uh, yeah, like I say, I've always preferred to just be as transparent as possible and, and uh, but not to be picking up the phone every day from 100 yeah. investors, you know. Time well, that. And I, I absolutely agree. I mean, you want to, especially when it comes to proactive. I mean, you, you actually don't want to wait for investors to call you to say, "Is there any bad news?" If there's bad news, it's almost more important uh, to call them up proactively and keep them in the loop because, a, that's a lot better than hiding it from them. B, sometimes they can help. Um, and so, yeah, I would say a, a real active effort to be transparent is really good. I was I was reacting more to the you you do get people who just want to picnic you every day uh, for data and and you want to keep that under control, but but yes I agree you, you want to be transparent. So I have I have a, a non I guess founder stock question. I'm looking for kind of a high level until maybe something else comes up here. So with convertible debt, so is it usually like um, so like a certain interest rate assigned to the debt they have, and so if it doesn't convert someday, mm -hmm. let's say the let's say the company actually folds, right? Now, so so does the convertible debt have like a certain interest rate that they're actually gaining while you have their money? So how that works? It, it typically does have an interest rate, yeah. Okay. And so then if they say that say the company doesn't make it, then the, are the then founders then on the hook for the debt? No, that okay. that tends to be the difference in debt with like investor funded startups is. I, I, I don't, I, I'm not aware of any cases, uh, I've, I've never seen a convertible note that had a personal guarantee. You know, with a bank, oh, you'll sure. always have a personal guarantee. Now, th that's what makes a convertible note different. It is a high risk instrument. It doesn't have a, con uh, a guarantee. So if the company goes out of business, it gets written off. Uh, now, it's also depends on what you have in your bylaws in your company. If your bylaws says that the founders like the management team is personal liable, then they would have to pay for the debt, but that would be an unusual thing. Right? That, that would be really un unusual given the, the risk. It makes there, a lot more sense. There actually. can be other teeth in it, like, for example, uh, you, you uh, not at all uncommon written into a convertible, convertible note would be if, if you uh, fail to deliver on this note, uh, then we own your IP. That, that's a really common one. Um, now, the reality is, no investor wants to own your IP because they didn't. They wouldn't have any clue what to do with it. You know, I mean, you sort of put it in there because it, it's it's standard. But the reality is, they don't want your IP because they don't know. Um, I mean, imagine them taking uh, David's IP on on tethered wind generation. <laughs> what are they going to do with that? Um, so, or, or coding. You know, you inherit a bunch of code. You know, that's like almost worthless. So really, I guess the value is just allows them to convert at a later time. The valuation may be more appropriate and more accurate. Yeah, it, it's great for you, the entrepreneur, because you just get worth more. Um, but at the same time, you're usually you, you give some kind of a kicker uh, b beyond the interest rate. You know, like some warrants, which are, you know, essentially just options, yeah. um, so that there's some sweetener, or or they get they get maybe a discount. Um, they don't pay exactly what the VC pays; they pay something less. Um, all those things are really good to, to run by the attorney to make sure you're not going to do something that's going to really annoy the VCs in the price round. Um, but yeah, there's always some kind of a kicker, which is appropriate because they, they put money in first. And we're not seeing any questions online, which I think means that we have to figure out our a chat room technology here because um, I have to believe there are questions. Uh, Y'all can feel free to email because actually everybody should have uh, my email address. So uh, feel free to uh, to email in any questions you have too, and we can uh, probably probably not today, but uh, get to those uh, later. 
once again, those presentations, I'm sure, on your website as well. Um, the uh, the slides aren't up there yet. I'll I'll make them. Uh, I'll, I'll post them and send an email to uh, to everybody to link with those. And this presentation will it, it's automatically converted to a YouTube. And I, I will go in and try to see if I can edit out the first twenty minutes of mostly silence, uh, that boring part, and then hopefully that'll be. Is there a the name of this video you should be looking for? Is it called something? Or? Um, I'll probably just call it the same same as the event, uh, like uh, Founders Stock uh, Next Point. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, and thank thanks, uh, thank you, everyone uh, online. Um, I I think the what, what we thought was a, a chat room functionality here in the comments doesn't seem to quite be that. So sorry about that. We'll uh, we'll figure that one out for next time. Uh, and by the way, uh, I should pitch the next time. We'll we'll do another one of these tackling um, um, assess your startup a checklist, um, which is a very practical, extremely pragmatic. It's it's pretty much a due diligence list. Look at your startup the way uh, an investor will, um, and uh, we'll tackle that on. I think it's December 11. It's on the the website, um, and we'll we'll also be streaming that, and we'll try to get to a functional chat room by then so that people online. Uh, can ask questions. Okay. And thanks with that, for us. Yeah. yeah, thanks everybody for joining us. I think uh, that's a wrap. Thank you.